be telling a story. It's about 20 years old now, this bad idea. Uh, it happened to me in high school, but maybe make it a bit more uh, easy for those to understand. I'm going to be talking about these three emotional states, pain, uh, fear really expressed as personal self-doubt, and then humor potentially as a way to overcome those two issues. Growing up, I was convinced of two things about myself, that I was very bright, maybe not humble, but very bright, and incredibly coordinated. And as proof of that, I played on the varsity basketball team at Space Camp, uh, which, as it turns out, you can pretty much just walk right onto. It's really not that hard. Um, one of the things I also knew about myself was that I was a terrible student. I had really no... Uh, time management skills. And so when Sunday night would come around, invariably it would involve lots of Mountain Dew, lots of caffeine, and a pathetic attempt to let that last minute uh, inspiration hit and get my work done by about 2 a.m. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I went to uh, a boarding school, and then uh, in high school there was no espresso bar, there was no coffee machine, there was no little mini fridge in the room. The only source for caffeine that was available to us was the Pepsi machine in the basement of the building. Uh, and it needed like a dollar and 25 and quarters, which no one ever had because you needed it for laundry day. Uh, and uh, so we would go downstairs with this great idea of getting free soda. Um, it says that you can't get free soda by tipping it. That's actually not true. It's not that you should do, but you certainly can. Um, so this is me flicking off that slime. They go, oh, labels are fine. Uh, a friend of mine who also had the same poor time management skills we go downstairs to start shaking the soda machine to get some free soda. Most of you can probably tell where I'm going with this bad idea. Um, so he decides to start shaking it. Me, being A, smart, and B, coordinated, decide to catch it. Uh, and so he's kind of pushing it over, and it's getting to that, like 30 degree, 40 degree balance, and I'm kind of trying to catch it, and all of a sudden it comes just absolutely crashing down. I am just crunched. This whole, you can hear bones crushing blood all over the floor. I am completely decimated by this machine. And my friend picks this thing up like a, like a mother who's taking a car off a trapped child by himself, picks this thing up, and he's lifting it, and he gets it to about his like chin area. He's trying to hold it over his head, and bam, it comes down again. And there's just this horrible crunching sound and blood everywhere. Uh, and I am now completely decimated by this machine. It took about six I think adult men to come take this thing off eventually, to, to peel this thing off of me. I hope you enjoyed the blood splatter, by the way. That took some time. I then moved in and lived in a hospital for the next year of my life uh, and slowly had to get rebuilt. I had blood transfusions and surgeries and metal rods inserted into my skeleton. It was a lot like being Wolverine without the body hair or sex appeal uh, of a 16-year-old living in this hospital. Uh, and over the time of that, uh, that incident, I had to redo everything. If you don't use your legs, you literally lose the ability to, to use them, to control them. And I couldn't do simple things that even my 10-month-old can do. I couldn't balance. I couldn't stand. Uh, and they, everything just started seeming really intimidating. These simple acts you just take for granted. Um, and so you can see I'm getting obviously past the, the pain part of the presentation into just pure abject fear and self-doubt. You, your, brain, your mind can't process it all at once, and so my initial fears were lunch. I'm supporting my entire body weight in my arms. I can't hold the lunch tray. How am I going to be able to go to lunch? Like, my friends are going to want to carry my food. Like, how am I going to feed myself? And then I started having this fear as the doctors told me that my left leg might not grow to the same size as my right leg. How am I going to go bowling? Because you can't rent bowling shoes with one shoe six inches bigger than the other. Like, my rolling game is going to be terrible. Uh, and it's after a while that your brain starts processing what's happening that the real fears hit you. I'm going to be alone. I'm not going to find someone to love this crippled body. Like, what am I going to possibly do to get past that? And then my parents started getting worried because I was no longer worried about the little things. And they couldn't say, you know, it's going to be okay because they didn't know. I might not have a left leg that would work. I might not ever have the ability to walk again. So what did they do? Well, instead of telling me everything was going to be fine, they did uh, something brilliant, something I never would have thought of. They made fun of me. Uh, they brought humor to the situation. They got me rolls of quarters for Christmas. Uh, they got me like a little Pepsi phone and little napkin holder. And they started teasing me so I would actually start laughing at the situation. I then started using that same technique, actually. After one of the surgeries, I had uh, a metal rod taken out of my leg and I framed it on my wall. And this girl came in in college and said, oh, what's that? I said, oh, it's a, it's a flute I picked up in Germany called a femur. And she picked it up and started playing it, and everyone was just vomiting. Like, it was so disgusting, and we all had a good laugh. So apologies, Ms. Jowell, if you ever watch this online. Um, 
That fear, though, kept coming back, uh, and I tried to return to, to campus. It had uh, one of the largest snowstorms that Boston's ever had, and uh, I was just, again, riddled with fear. How am I going to walk uh, on my crutches through this blizzard, through the snowstorm on ice? I'm going to fall. I'm going to shatter my legs again. And this fear, just, just gut-wrenching fear came back. And the thing is, it's, it's such a powerful reaction. Fear is, is supposed to be there to protect you from pain, to prevent you from getting hurt. That's why we have that fear-based emotion. And it's very hard to think about anything else. If you can, if you can, if you can focus on that humor, it actually, you can never take the pain away, but you can dial back the initial fear response. Uh, and so there's this great scene in Forrest Gump when Lieutenant Dan is shaking up at the storm without his legs. And he's like, you call this a storm? And I tried that technique. I'm sitting there in the blizzard and there's ridiculous snow. I was like, really? Ten pounds of snow in two days? That's the best you got, God? Like, you call this a blizzard? And I started going out and kind of crutching my way through the snow laughing, and it was fine. Uh, which is entirely why all of you are naked to me right now, because <laughs> it just takes the, the fear out of, out of public speaking and presentation. Uh, and I found this to be a really successful technique that whenever you're afraid of doing something, to find something even remotely amusing about the situation, like, I don't know, having your technology crash in front of a cast of dozens of people when you're trying to talk about things. Um, and so fast forward, I was presented with the biggest challenge of my life, which was to throw myself off of this little platform in New Zealand at the world's largest bungee jump site with the only life-saving device attached to my legs. And I had two options. I could either be afraid of this moment, or I could look at this and be like, seriously, you call this a jump? And do it. So I did.